Welcome to CardioCast for Friday, November 29th. I'm Dr. Jim Dwyer. This week, MD Edge devotes the entire podcast to card talk. In this edition, my brother Jerry and I welcome Dr. Kendra Grubb and Dr. Asita Buku, two structural interventionalists with very unique and interesting backgrounds. Talk about breaking the glass ceiling. But first, thanks to all of you who've helped us make this podcast better by taking our short listener survey. We encourage those of you who haven't to complete the survey by following the link in the show notes. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome to MD Edge Card Talk with the Dwyer Brothers. I'm Dr. Jim Dwyer. And I'm Dr. Jerry Dwyer. Well, welcome, Jerry. Always good to hear your voice. Uh, so today's today's topic is uh, regarding TAVR, which stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement, as I'm sure our audience is well aware of. And we have some exceptional guests with us today, both from Emory University, Dr. Kendra Grubb, who's from the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and Dr. Asita Buku from the Division of Cardiology. Can you both take a moment and tell us a bit about yourselves? Maybe, Kendra, do you want to start? Sure. Well, first, thanks, guys, for having us on your show. It's an exciting topic to be able to talk about transcatheter therapies, and particularly transcatheter aortic valve replacement. As you know, TAVR just this year was approved for the low-risk patients. So there is a lot to talk about. But in regard to who I am, uh, my name is Kendra Grubb. I'm a cardiac surgeon at Emory and the surgical director of the Structural Heart and Valve Center. I have a little bit of a unique background in that after I trained in general surgery, I went on to do cardiac surgery training and then flipped over and did interventional cardiology training. So I get to have a foot in both camps. And um, then after my training, went to the University of Louisville and helped build a structural heart program And then only about a year and a half ago, made the move to Emory to join one of the original teams uh, in the country doing transcatheter valves. You know, they started doing valves back in 2007 and have really grown a robust program. I'm joined here by our newest member, Dr. Asita Buku. She actually trained with us in structural heart and joined us as faculty just this September. So Asita? Hi there. Thank you so much for having us today. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I echo in all that Dr. Grubb said so eloquently. Um, I joined uh, here as faculty at Emory just in September after completing a two-year fellowship in interventional cardiology and structural heart intervention. Uh, my path towards structural heart intervention is probably interesting as, as most anyone um, in, in this career's uh, path is. I grew up in Albania originally, and I came to the U.S. at age 18, Uh, I completed my college education, then medical school, internal medicine residency, and uh, cardiovascular disease training here in the U.S. And then I, at the completion of my cardiology fellowship, it was clear in my mind without a shadow of a doubt that the future and the most exciting things happening in all of cardiology were in the realm of structural heart intervention. So I pursued a two-year fellowship here at Emory and it has without a doubt been the most rewarding part of my training. And I was fortunate to have incredible mentorship by some of the brightest and most talented people in the field like Dr. Grubb. And now I get to continue to be mentored by her and our other partners as I continue to grow as a young faculty member. So I am incredibly excited uh, and grateful to be in this field. That is that is so cool, both of you. It's very very amazing. And a quick question, Kendra, were, were both you and Asita uh, involved in the, the picture that went around the world? Yeah, that's kind of fun. Um, we, uh, you know, when she first came on faculty, I thought it would be fun to take a picture of our first case together where she wasn't attending. And that's that picture. And I, I, you know, I wanted to introduce my new partner to kind of my world. And so posted it on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And I expected, you know, my couple thousand friends maybe to see it. And, you know, it ended up gaining some traction and it's been seen by over a hundred thousand people. 
in o- over 70 countries all around the world. So it, it clearly is time. And oh we just had an amazing outpouring of support. Uh, a lot of Atta girls and you go and, you know, breaking the glass ceiling type of stuff. But, you know, more than even that was just the recognition that there are so few women in cardiac surgery and interventional cardiology. I mean, I, I think I can speak for both Asita and me when I say we look forward to the day that that picture isn't novel. Yeah. Was everybody a- in the in the operating theater women? So the team that was doing the case actually was the echo sonographer, the, um, technician. the technician was, as well as the circulating nurse. That particular TAVR was done under conscious sedation. So there was no anesthesiologist in the room. And so the entire team was women. That, wow. is, uh, that is fabulous. And as the father of an orthopedic resident, uh, young lady, uh, it certainly... Uh, did have a great shout out to um, all the surgeons uh, across the world and uh, congratulations to a phenomenal team at Emory and to you both for presenting that and doing that and pushing it out across the world. Thank you. Well, wh- where, should, where, where do you think, Kendra and Asita, should we, where should we start uh, with our in TAVR discussion today? Where do you want to start? Well, I can talk to you a little bit about kind of what my focus has been, and then I think it lends itself nicely to kind of Asita's expertise now. So one of the things as a cardiac surgeon that I'm, I'm very focused on is making sure that we're making the right choices for these patients. Just because we have one-year data in 70-year-olds for the low-risk TAVR study doesn't necessarily mean it's the right valve for every patient out there. So until recently, everything we knew about TAVR was an octogenarian. Every study we'd done um, started with high risk and operable, intermediate risk. All of them were octogenarians on average. And so it was hard to extrapolate that type of data, even though the results were excellent. It was hard to use that in younger patients. The low risk trial does a great job of answering some of that question, but believe it or not, the average age is still in the 70s, early 70s. But still, I don't know that you can extrapolate and say that that's the right thing to do in a 50-year-old. So my focus right now is making sure that we have lifetime management of these patients and that the choices we make today are what we are going to use as our platform for tomorrow. So whether that first valve is a surgical valve and then we're able to put a TAVR inside or we do a TAVR first and then go forward and put another TAVR inside and maybe even a third, And if you're young enough, you're still going to need surgery in your lifetime. So that's where this heart team really comes into play. And one of the things that Asita did a lot of during her training was valve and valve workups and talk about these patients and what we're looking for to even be able to do a valve and valve um, and make this a reality. So I'm going to turn it over to her and have her talk a little bit about that planning, as well as one of the leaflet modification strategies we do here called Basilica. What's it, what's it called? Basilica. It refers to leaflet modification in specifically in valve and valve TAVR, but also in native valve leaflets where there's a high risk for coronary obstruction. So I think that especially now with the low risk approval the heart team decision is more important than ever because we are faced with younger patients. We are faced with decisions on lifetime valve planning, not just, you know, for the foreseeable eight to 10 years, if they live that long. Now we know that our low risk younger patients will live longer and we have to think about not just tomorrow, but what's going to happen seven to 15 years down the road and how, what is our next step when their bioprosthesis degenerates? And this is where valve and valve work becomes this very important and actually essential in trying to understand what are the options for these patients down the road and how can we either offer them valve and valve procedures safely with uh, mitigating the risk of coronary obstruction, or perhaps w- would they be surgical candidates further down the road? These are all questions that we don't have answers for, but that we're actively researching and looking for answers to. And here at Emory, with collaboration with the National Heart Institute, 
we have been spearheading efforts to split the biprosthetic valve leaflets in order to mitigate the risk of coronary obstruction when performing valve and valve TAVR. And this is something that I spent a great part of my training doing, and it's a solid procedure that happens in very few places in the country, but it has, in our experience, it has been essential in being able to perform valve and valve TAVR, even in patients where this was previously not believed to be possible. So the, the issue here is that, you know, for some of the surgical valves, because they sit high in the annulus, it makes the distance to the coronary artery insufficient to put a valve inside without covering that coronary. And in the unlikely event that you cover a coronary, the mortality jumps up over 50%. So we identify these patients ahead of time, and Dr. Buku is an absolute expert in the CT 3D reconstruction for these patients, uh, looking at specific measurements to try to predict who will have a problem, either native leaflets or surgical valves, and then whether or not we can put a valve inside. Um, and so uh, she, she did a lot of work on this during her residency with us. How about in, in having the, the decision process move along for these types of patients? Do the patients themselves and the families, uh, do they really get into helping to make these decisions or, or is it still so confusing for, for families that they don't know what the heck you're talking mm -hmm. about? Great question. We absolutely believe in and we engage in shared decision making with every single one of our patients. Uh, certainly it is hard to explain sometimes these novel techniques, but we like to believe that we're successful in explaining to them, you know, all their options. And there are, our patients range from patients that have never heard of it before and that agree to proceed with it to patients that have looked this up on the internet and then that travel from out of state because they know that one of the places where they can get this done in a safer and more expert way would be Emory University. So we have patients that are self-referred or referred from other uh, structural interventionists in the field, come from out of state specifically for these types of more complex valve and valve procedures with leaflet modification or alternate access, et cetera. Who's on your pre-op team for the TAVR group? We have a whole number of surgeons, cardiologists, interventionists, structural art, who makes up your team at Emory? Our team is made up of the interventional cardiologist that sees the patient in clinic, a cardiac surgeon that sees the patient in clinic, our valve coordinator, our nurse navigator, and then we have several research coordinators that also assess trial eligibility for patients for current ongoing trials or uh, early feasibility studies of novel uh, devices. So our Heart team meetings, which happen every week, consist right. of every single member of the team, so all the interventional cardiologists, all the cardiac surgeons that are involved in our team, as well as the other team members, our physician assistants, nurse practitioners, our very important structural imagers who we really uh, respect and cannot um, accomplish. Sometimes end up being pretty, pretty spirited discussions that you get into. We do, we do, you know, and we've even added more team members, um, heart failure specialists, because some of these patients, you know, they're presenting with advanced heart failure. And so I, I think that what we've been able to accomplish is really putting the patient at the center of all of this. And as Dr. Buku was mentioning, we do n really believe in patient-centered care, which is very individualized to that specific patient and we believe in shared decision-making. And so it's not uncommon for us, for some of these really complex cases, to almost have like a first date. We ask that they bring their family members and that they educate themselves and they will meet somewhere between four to six different team members on their initial visit, just to make sure we've explained things in a variety of ways. Um, and as they go through this process, hopefully they have their questions answered and that they have enough information to be able to make a decision about what's right for them. Very rarely are we seeing truly 
inoperable patients. We see a lot of extremely high risk patients and high risk for Emory may be inoperable at some other places. And they've been told that a surgeon outside of Emory won't operate on them. Oftentimes we will find some effective solutions, but it's really taught discussing what the expectations are as well as the risks. And so we're in a very fortunate situation in that every patient we get to say, you know, there, this is what will happen if we do nothing. This is your option surgically. This is your option using a transcatheter therapy or novel technique. So it's a really amazing place to be right now. Yeah, in this it sure, so, yeah it, sounds, it sounds amazing. And I may get in trouble with somebody uh, across the country making this comment. You guys do it extremely well. How well do you think a lot of the other places do in some other programs across the country? Do some places really need to step it up? Are the statistics being watched carefully from uh, various registries? Is there any way that you can analyze things in that regard easily? Well, that's a great point and a challenging question to answer because I think that as the landscape of structural intervention is changing, the first 20 years or so, we were in a different part of the learning curve. So in some ways, because everything was experimental and because we were dealing with inoperable and very high risk older patients, in some ways, there was perhaps maybe a higher tolerance for learning while doing because there were no other options. As a young structural interventionist myself, this is part of my daily struggle, which is, you know, how to do already established therapies and techniques in, in a way that is really safe with excellent patient outcomes, but also be bold enough to engage in more experimental or novel techniques and make my contribution towards the fields advancing and moving forward because there's still a lot of work to be done. And when I say that, I speak for probably every interventional structural cardiologist and cardiac surgeon out there in that our current challenge is to continue to move the field forward, but we are held up just different standards when it comes to quality and outcomes. And so, uh, so, so somewhere along the way, I saw something about tiered certification for TAVR programs. Is that something thought about or already in process as far as level one or level two? And uh, yeah, it's, it's been proposed um, when they reviewed everyone for the updated national coverage decision. They proposed a tiered system where you would not limit the number of sites that did TAVR, but you would limit the complexity of the cases that individual sites did. So you would have certain centers of excellence throughout the country uh, where alternative access or something like basilica, a leaflet splitting modification or a leaflet modification technique, something like that would be only offered at those centers, but that your kind of routine TAVR could be done across the country. And that was never formalized. I am a proponent of that type of model. I think that if you're doing some operation one time a year, that that's probably not good enough for your patients. But the flip side of that is access to care. And so when we talk to patients at our center, they're willing to come across the country for care, but that's not necessarily the reality. And there is not a way for patients to understand currently the difference between a site that does 500 TAVRs a year and a site that does 20. That's going to change next year. In late in fall of 2020, there will be public reporting of outcomes. And so people will be able to just see what our outcomes are. And I think that will start to stratify different programs. And those programs that maybe will only have that challenging case once a year, hopefully will be more inclined to refer that patient to a center of excellence. And certainly there is a new qualification where you can apply to be a center of excellence. So all of this is a very changing landscape. Um, the new national coverage decision made it easier for sites to enter the world of TAVR. The requirements are lower. But the hope is that with these other things coming into, into play, the TBT registry data being public and this stratification of centers across the country, 
that we will see a natural trend in that regard. But currently there is no formal tiered system. Okay. That was a great response. Thank you. How is your TAVR numbers, how have they grown over the last few years? Where are you guys roughly now number of procedures per year or whatever? We've been seeing about a 20% increase per year in the past three years. Our volume of TAVR, but especially complex cases, has definitely increased by quite a bit. And, you know, some of these complex cases, as opposed to a straightforward transfemoral TAVR with conscious sedation, which can be done in about an hour, some of these more complex procedures take anywhere from four to six hours. So that's also a factor. Um, Our goal is 1,000 structural heart cases per year. And we're getting closer and closer to that goal every day. That's amazing. And how, how many how many of you are doing the procedures there at Emory? So it is four interventional cardiologists and structural cardiologists, Dr. Vasilis Babaliaros, Dr. Adam Greenbaum, Dr. Tennant Everetti, and myself here at Emory Midtown. Um, we have Dr. Jim Stewart at Emory St. Joseph's Hospital. And in terms of our cardiac surgeons, we have Dr. Kendra Grubb, we have Dr. Robert Guyton, and Dr. Gaetano Payon, Dr. Machiers over at St. Joseph's Hospital, and Dr. Brent Keeling at times. We have a variety of other cardiac surgeons that don't primarily work with us, but that certainly are very familiar with our cases and, and available to help when necessary. So Emory has tra- uh, traditionally had three different sites doing structural heart cases, TAVR, MitraClip, participating in the various trials. And each of the sites had grown to be a high volume center. Well, as you can imagine from a business standpoint, it's hard to resource three sites within one program. And so when I came on board, it was during a time of transition where Emory was consolidating resources at the Midtown campus with the idea that even within our own system, we would have one center of excellence with two other smaller programs to be able to accommodate those people in the community and those areas in and around Atlanta. But those other sites would primarily be focused on the the more routine care as well as some of the industry sponsored trials. So what we've done now is really consolidate things so that we can have many, we can help many more patients at one site, which is currently our Midtown campus. And that's where we're seeing a lot of growth. And that's also where we have something really unique and exciting and that just this past spring, our new offices opened. And this is something that I'm really proud of and proud to be a part of. So Emory has decided to go away from these strict lines between cardiology and interventional cardiology or cardiac surgery. And our structural heart program is housed all in one common area where my next door neighbor is an interventional cardiologist and next to him is an imager. And our reading room where our fellows hang out is literally across the hall. And so it's this constant collaboration and constant Um, sharing of ideas. And it spills over from just being part of the heart team to everything we do. When I have an interventional cardiologist right down the hall, I may say, hey, I got sent this patient for cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting. What do you think? Can you take a look? Maybe this patient is better for PCI. This heart team is spilling over to the care of all patients in cardiology and cardiac surgery, which I think is really exciting and really unique. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's promotes that excellence of care and really doing what's best for the patient. In some of the TAVR patients, do you do a lot of sort of hybrid procedures where if there is coronary disease, how do you approach that with, you do stenting um, same day, days before and the coronaries and then do the TAVR at, at what point in, in time? Yes, we do. And there's a lot of variability because no two patients are the same, obviously, but right. we, um, it's all part of our shared decision-making, whether depending on the patient's age and comorbidities, whether we go the TAV or PCI route versus the cabbage surgical AVR route. And also, more interestingly, in our valve patients, often there's multi-valve disease. The patient that comes in with aortic stenosis might also have concomitant mitral regurgitation. 
So then it becomes a question of which valve do we treat first? How do we stage the second valve intervention? How treating one valve might affect the severity of the second valve and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of deliberation, careful consideration that happens with all these patients. And if we have to intervene on a coronary, we typically try to do that before the TAVR and we stage that you know, by a couple of weeks, 30 days before a TAVR. Sometimes we even consider doing a robotic Lima to LAD after a TAVR. Other times, like I mentioned with the multiple valve disease, we may treat the aortic stenosis first. And if the patient improves, but is not quite where we wanted them to be after that intervention and the mitral regurgitation remains severe, then we stage a mitral clip procedure or some other transcatheter mitral therapy after that and things of that nature, or tricuspid diseases. Somebody has severe triple vessel coronary disease and, and severe aortic stenosis, do they get ever get bypass surgery and, and a TAVR rather than a SAVR? I'll defer to Dr. Grubb on this one. <laughs> well, that doesn't happen that often. Um, but uh, I, I think that we discuss all of these patients um, the same. And so if that particular patient was high risk and that made the most sense, if you could do, let's say, an off-pump cabbage and then come back and do the TAVR or vice versa, I think that right now we're in a place where we can offer patients some really unique options. As Dr. Buku just mentioned, we had a patient recently where the plan, the final plan was to do a transcatheter aortic valve replacement and then a robotic limited LAD. And it worked beautifully. And there are other patients that that's the plan, and it's when the coronary gets bad enough, we'll come back and do the robotic Lima to LAD. The nice thing about having a valve center is that we really are able to offer a very broad portfolio of treatments, and it doesn't have to be kind of a one-stop shop for just one thing, and we can really be creative in the way we address each individual patient's needs. What about over the last 36 months, uh, your post-procedure pacemaker placement? Have you noticed a decline in the numbers based upon the development of new technologies uh, with the valves coming up? Or what are your thoughts on that? I think our pacemaker rates at Emory have been historically low compared to national averages, and we continue to maintain that trend. Here at Emory, we have been proponents of the higher valve implantation from the earlier years, and that has led to a lower pacemaker rate overall. I think our pacemaker rates several years in a row had been certainly under 5%, but at times even under 2%. And as you mentioned, as the valve technologies have gotten better and you know our deployment techniques have gotten slicker, this continues right. to be the trend. Yeah, it's actually interesting. Dr. Buku and I today, um, we're doing a self-expanding valve. And there is a new technique that's all over social media with this ARIO projection. And we actually used that technique today. And the valve ended up very high. Um, it was a beautiful deployment and position and no pacemaker at a, in, in a patient who was potentially at risk. And so I, I think that there is two parts to that question of pacemaker. One is being respectful of the patient's anatomy and two, um, choosing the right valve for the patient and then the technique that you use. And some of those technique things, as she mentioned, landing valves high, we know that if we land valves low, we know where the membranous septum is, we know where the conduction system lives, and we know how to put it at risk. If we can land valves higher or be very thoughtful about our valve choice and our technique, we can really decrease that pacemaker rate. So you bring up a good point because if you look at the two low risk trials from the United States, one has a double digit pacemaker rate and one doesn't. Right. And Within the self-expanding valve platform, their data, uh, if you look at the actual distribution, you had sites that their pacemaker rate was 2%, and then you had sites where their pacemaker rate was 20%. So there's a lot to learn about technique, and we're hoping to 
learn from the groups that had the 2% pacemaker rate and mimic their techniques. And I think this REO projection cusp overlap that we're seeing all over social media is one of the ways to do it. So that's uh, the self-expanding stent. I think I saw a little bit about that, that, you know, it allows you to land it more precisely. And is it a much more calm and slow delivery kind of situation and allows you some adjustment? Yes, yes, it does. So you have the opportunity to recapture the valve fully and reposition it. And it allows for adjustments and precise landing, especially with the newer technique of cusp overlap, where your anatomic landmarks seem to be a lot more fiduciary to, and then there seems to be no diving either towards the ventricle or upwards towards the aorta with valve deployment. Okay. And the, there was, I mean, there was one system I saw something about the portico system or something and comments about increased uh, paravalvular leak. Is that getting resolved with the self-expanding systems or is it just that one particular system? Well, Portico isn't FDA approved yet, so it's hard to say much um, other than, you know, we know what there are early trials and they're high risk patients. We know the okay. results of those, um, but we can't really comment too much on those. Um, there are three commercially available platforms now. There's the self-expanding valve by Medtronic, uh, which is their Evolute platform. There's a balloon expandable valve, which is the third generation of the Sapien, and that's by Edwards. And then Boston Scientific has the Lotus valve, which is a mechanically expanding valve and a really unique system. We have used all three here at Emory and currently use primarily as our kind of go-to valve, the balloon expandable valve, but uh, more and more are finding patients that we think would be good candidates for the other valve choices. And this all has to do with their anatomy. Getting back to kind of something we touched on earlier, that lifelong management of valvular heart disease. We want the biggest platform with the largest effective orifice areas and not to create patient prosthesis mismatch. In cardiac surgery, we know what happens when you put two smaller valves in patients for their body surface area, and they don't do as well as those patients who get larger valves. And so we need to be respecting that data that we know and kind of recreating the same thought process in transcatheter valves. And so sometimes we'll choose a different valve based on the patient's literally the size of the valve that we would be able to put in and how much flow we would get through that valve. Uh, and so more and more, we are, are not only looking at, is this patient a good candidate for TAVR or SAVR? We're also looking at, if they went down one of the other pathways, what size valve would they get? And is that going to be a good platform for their next valve? So there's a lot of decisions we're making these days. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> very, very complicated. I, I mean, I grew up, I learned, I had a very extensive training, at, believe it or not, at Emory when I started my interventional career it was from Dr. Grunzig and I went there for a three or four day seminar <laughs> and then went home to St. Louis and started doing interventions. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you got trained by the master. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think that was like 1984 when I went and, I, and unfortunately Dr. Grunzig, as you know, died in 1985, but he was one of the true Emory game changers, uh, in the history of Emory University. But it's great that it's so sophisticated and the newer technology you guys are using and analysis is just uh, uh, unbelievable. It's, it's fantastic. It, it's really exciting. And, you know, not only has the heart team spread into other areas of the management and treatment of cardiac disease, but it's, it's crossing fields. And, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in now is heart failure and structural interventions or interventional heart failure. What can we do to manipulate the size of ventricles using catheters and wires and hooks and anchors and pulleys and things to try to reshape the heart? And I think that this is a whole new avenue that you know the original TAVR started us down this pathway and we've gone into all four valves and now we're crossing into other fields, heart failure, transplant, bad, 
well, probably not transplant other than trying to prevent transplants, but so many opportunities in this field. So that's really what I'm excited about is this interventions for heart failure. Asita, what do you think is exciting these days? It, you actually it, stole my next question of what are the innovations <laughs> and inventions. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, so yeah, that would be my one of my last questions. Uh, absolutely. I love, I love technology. I love the advancement. So who better to ask than uh, the cutting edge? Uh, now, well, for me, it's a posterior ventriculoplasty that um, you're able right. to place in the um, subannular plane of the mitral valve. And it not only pulls in the ventricle and realigns the papillary muscles to decrease mitral regurgitation, but it decreases the size of the ventricle. And we're seeing really good results. It's made by Encore. It's called AccuCinch. And uh, they should be starting their pivotal trial soon. And it'll be really exciting to see. We have uh, treated a few patients here at Emory and really had excellent results. Dr. Buku and I have done these cases together. And the patients feel better and they and their hearts look better on echo and their mitral regurgitation may or may not change at all, but their exercise tolerance and their KCCQ and their quality of life scores are all improved. So we, we're realizing that we're doing something. Uh, we just have a lot to learn and uh, it may take us another decade or so to figure it out, but it's a really exciting time. Yes, I think I am excited about just about everything because uh, having just started, everything is still novel to me. Um, you're, not, you're, not, you're not old enough to be burned yeah. out some days <laughs> like us old guys. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, I, I, yeah. you're the absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm getting days. excited just yeah. about he hearing about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is fantastic. Hopefully, I don't need any of it anytime <laughs> soon, but I think, I'll be are... heading to, I think I'll be heading to Emory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll be here. Go, go ahead, Asita. I'm sorry Please. to interrupt you. Please. No, no, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think we have made incredible progress in the aortic valve disease treatment in the past 15 to 20 years. And I am hopeful and I'm really excited to see the same degree of success and advancement in the other valves, such as the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, where we still, uh, it feels as if we still haven't cracked the code uh, per se. And uh, there's a lot of exciting work being done in, in those fields. And I'm just super excited to see what the future will bring. Well, I think it's, I think it's it, for me, it's, it's wonderful to hear about the collegial interaction that you guys have as cardiologists and surgeons. And, you know, I think back to the old days when I started the intervention and, you know, it was a pitched battle between us trying to fix the arteries, uh, uh, less invasively versus the surgeons. Uh, they really, they hated us uh, in those days in some re regards. And But where you guys are and where you're heading is exactly, you know, where things need to be for the sake of the patient, I believe. Comments, Jerry? I echo that, Jim. And uh, yes, um, thinking back over the last 25, uh, 30 years, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the technology um, and uh, this was just discussed, and now we're referring patients to centers like Emory and across the country. Um, uh, one topic, uh, the valve and valve. Uh, is there any final words on, on where that's heading? I know we talked about it briefly. Um, the other valves, mitral, anything like that? So with the valve and valve, we still, the majority of the cases that we see are TAVR within surgical biprosthetic valves. That's correct. Um, right. However, we will be seeing a lot more TAVR within TAVR. Um, we anticipate as, you know, we're coming towards how long since the, sorry, one second. How long has it been since the intermediate approval? Is it five, six years? Depends on intermediate which valve. Risk. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're at five years on partner two. They just released the five year data on partner two. Um, that's your intermediate risk group. And those were 80 year olds. And right. you know, the problem when you put valves in 80 year olds is the valve lasts longer than they do. Um, and so it may be another eight years before we really start seeing TAVR failures in these younger patients in the low risk trials. Um, so we, I think that we're creating a whole new entity, just like when congenital surgeons in the 80s started to do complex surgeons, surgeries on babies, they created 
adult congenital surgery, a specialty that exists now that didn't exist then because nobody lived to be five, let That's alone five. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that we are creating a new field, which is what are you going to do with failed TAVR valves? What are you going to do with failed transcatheter mitrals? And um, that's going to be a whole new field of intervention as well as surgery. And one of the things we're looking at here is the CT scans of patients who have had TAVRs and projecting if in 10 years this valve was to fail, let's look at the anatomy now and see how many of those patients are even going to be candidates anatomically for a valve and valve. We talked about doing a basilica or a leaflet modification strategy for a failed surgical valve in order to put a TAVR valve inside, but we're going to be creating the same problem with TAVR valves when these patients live 10, 15 years, and it's the same tissue, so we expect these biologic valves to fail eventually, and what are we going to do then? And so we need to spend the next decade trying to figure that out as well. Unbelievable. Wow. Just great. Wow. This is, uh, this is great, great stuff. Uh, it certainly sounds to me like uh, Emory University continues to be leading the charge and changing the game. And uh, I really want to compliment both you, Dr. Grubb and Dr. Boku, of really being, uh, sounds like, superstars in this field. And I, I really hope that things continue to be driven by people like you as the advancements are are continued in the in the research over these next few years. Any last words, Kendra or Sita, before we wrap it up? No, we thank you for having us, and we are really excited to be a part of this revolution, if you will. <laughs> yeah, it's That's it's great. great. This has been a great discussion. I've certainly learned a lot, and both Jerry and I appreciate you're sharing your time and your brilliance and uh, and making us a little smarter. I'm sure you'll make a lot of our listeners a lot smarter because of you guys willing to spend your time today. That was a great time. I learned a lot and uh, certainly uh, looking forward to hopefully a follow-up podcast with you both. A follow-up would be really fun. Thank you know, you, you, you guys are rock stars. So that's as my daughter says. So uh, <laughs> carry the torch and keep going. Tell All her right. good luck All and right. that she will succeed in everything that she wants to. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to comment before we end that, uh, you know, MD Edge has been a wonderful, working for them has been a wonderful experience for me with their journalists and uh, great, our great cardiology editor, Catherine Hackett. And MD Edge really does afford an extra method to a lot of physicians and other clinicians to try and stay up to date on the top news and advances in cardiology. And it's pretty easy to, to find MD Edge cardiology by visiting mdedge.com slash cardiology. So uh, I think that's it for the Dwyer brothers at MD Edge. And we want to thank you all for listening. Yeah. All right, you guys take care. Take Thanks care. very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, bro. Okay. Bye. Bye. Remember, you can find CardioCast via Amazon Alexa, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please leave us a rating or review. And be sure to take our short listener survey. For MD Edge, I'm Dr. Jim DeWire.